Welcome to Zero Knowledge. I'm your host, Anna Rose. In this podcast, we will be exploring the latest in zero knowledge research and the decentralized web, as well as new paradigms that promise to change the way we interact and transact online. This week, guest host Tarun Shitra and I chat with Stani from Ave. We talk about the early days of DeFi, the introduction of collateralized loans and stablecoins, flash loans, flash minting, and Aave's new credit delegation function. We also touch on the effects of gas, L2s, and where the space might be headed. But first, I want to say thank you to this week's sponsor, Hermes. Hermes is an L2 solution that scales token transfers on top of Ethereum, which can handle up to 2,000 transactions per second. Designed for high-frequency tokens, Hermes is a ZK rollup, a topic we often cover on the show, including this one, and a project which leverages ZK snarks for validity proofs with on-chain data availability. These zero-knowledge circuits are developed using IDEN 3's circuit compiler language, CIRCOM. The system also brings a novel consensus algorithm called Proof of Donation that gives 40% of each transaction fee back to the Ethereum community as a donation which supports Ethereum development. Now, after passing two security audits, Hermes is running a bug bounty program. They're offering up to 100 ETH to whoever discovers any critical vulnerabilities. If you want to hear more about the project, I recently had Jordi Bailena, technical lead at Hermes, on the show for an interview. I've added the link in the show notes. And if you want to find out more about Hermes and the bug bounty program, head over to Hermes.io. I've also added the link there. So thank you so much, Hermes, for sponsoring. Now, here is our conversation with Stani from Ave. So today I'm chatting with Stani from Ave and guest host Tarun. Hi, Tarun. Hey, happy to be back. And welcome to the show, Stani. Uh, thanks, Anna and Tarun, for having me here. So, Stani, you're from the project Ave. I want to hear, and I, I know like you've probably said this every time you've been on a podcast, but I, I think our audience actually doesn't know that much about the Ave project. Can you give us a very short timeline of like what it was and what it is today? Mm. Yeah, I mean, the project itself was named Ave a couple of years ago. So before that, we were used to call uh, ETHLAND, which is short for mm -hmm. Ethereum Lending. And uh, Ethland was a project that we we started to actually build in already 2016, very very kind of slowly. So uh, I was still studying in in, in university uh, in in Helsinki, Finland, where I'm originally from, and um, I was actually studying law. So I, I have a background in software development. So I used to develop financial technology, so practically more of uh, front end user experiences. And that was kind of like uh, my first startup experiences. And always with fintech, you end up meeting regulation quite a lot. And somehow I got excited about law because I didn't understand well all of these rules. You know, why there's so many rules when mm -hmm. you want to do some innovation and, you know, you want to help people and you see a lot of potential. And I started to read more and more. And, and then I went to study law. And at some point at the end of law school, I, I, I got in, interested in contracts, contract law, and kind of like how to make contracts more efficient, automated, and also somehow the whole legal industry, something that's actually modern. You know, we still have a legal industry that is, is a bit, uh, a lot of paper-based and, and feels quite old-fashioned, at least to me when I was studying. Mm -hmm. And I started to read about a lot of things, AI, uh, contracts in general, digitalization. And one of the things I uh, stumbled upon was practically uh, smart contracts. And I started to dig, deep, dig deeper and, and uh, understood that there's practically a concept where you can uh, publish code into a distributed ledger, uh, a blockchain ledger. And, and practically, it's very difficult to manipulate that data. So you, you, you can put data that is very hard uh, to manipulate. And one of the places where you could do that, uh, actually the only one I was was widely used, well, widely, it was still early, uh, was Ethereum. And mm -hmm. that kind of like got me excited that uh, actually 
you know, we can do contracts and codify things, you know, in a, in a way that they execute by themselves. So you, you kind of don't need to go later into court and prove things. You know, of course, like this is the black yeah. and white uh, uh, thing. And then I wanted to just try like what we could create uh, and somehow went back and cr- we started to build financial applications because I already did that. So uh, we yeah. created basically first proof of concept of uh, Eatland, which is practically a on-chain, was on- on-chain peer-to-peer lending protocol back then. Was Eatland a hackathon project or was it like a, like, how did you, was it a team? How did, how did that come about? And by the way, your story of coming from law to blockchain is cool. <laughs> I don't know that we've had, and like, and the fact that you also had that technical background, it's just neat. It's like a kind of a unique perspective. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's, it's quite different and that's what makes the space interesting because it really doesn't matter that much, the ba- background itself. So to contribute in, in uh, say, decentralized finance or any kind of like on-chain system, you don't need to be, let's say, developer. There's It's it's so kind of uh, more wider than that. So there's different areas you can contribute. And that's, what, that's pretty interesting. But I would say it was a hackathon project in the sense that, uh, you know, we were doing something that was very challenging for us and we, we didn't have the skills. You know, we failed a lot of times. It was fr- frustrating at some points. Uh, and at some points we were like quitting that this is just too hard. This is like, it's <laughs> really difficult. And, but at some point we realized a bit that, okay, that practically it's, uh, we can actually do this. And it was as early as 2017 January, uh, when we actually released a Kovan version of, of the, the Eatland protocol. And it was very simple. I mean, you, you practically, uh, uh, had only very basic functions. You could do loans between two peers. It's not the same that we see in DeFi with the pooled systems that that we see today, pooled capital, but uh, it was something back then. And this was when we practically had only one decentralized exchange, uh, Ether Delta. And a bit later that year, for example, Kyber came. So liquidity started to pile up a bit. This ecosystem was very small then. So what we did then wasn't beautiful at all. So I would say that it was a hackathon in in, in, in mindset. <laughs> <laughs> okay. But like we actually tried to make something that people would use. So yeah. yeah. But, like who are your co-founders, by the way? Like because you say we, so I'm guessing you're you didn't do this alone. Yeah, I, I guess like funny thing about the whole project, it started that uh, I started to build a bit, and uh, we had another kind of. Uh, uh, a, a person back then, uh, his name was Anton, and he was already building stuff like very small blockchain related things. He he tried to build some sort of a way to ensure market prices very, very uh, early. Also, I practically went to Reddit with my idea and, and also actually went to Facebook. And there was this Ethereum group back then that started to grow, mainly, mainly of uh, people who actually are kind of like more interested in, in going long on Ethereum. But uh, mm. in, in, in Reddit and in Facebook, practically I was vo- voicing out that I would like to create this kind of a project and, and see how it goes. And if there's someone who want to, wants to join, uh, there's different tasks that you could do, like it would be pretty awesome. And then people start to come. Uh, Jordan, for example, he's our CEO. He was one of the, the uh, first persons. And I think uh, he was, I think I made the post roughly month after the Covent release or something like that. So it was very, very early. And uh, yeah, that's how the team formed. And funny part about uh, Reddit was that when I posted about this idea, like nobody, liked, like there was so many kind of like a comments against that. Why would you even like put assets as a collateral? So the way the, the way that this oh, wow. over, over collateralized lending works is that as a, as a borrower, you put a, you, you put a deposit collateral and against your deposit, you can borrow something else. So actually, there was like a lot of uh, resistance and, and kind of vocaling about uh, why would you actually put, put anything as a collateral and, and borrow when you can actually sell the asset? And I kind of I understood that uh, this was in the Ethereum subreddit. So I kind of understand that, wow, like in terms of like understanding of economics, definitely like there's still like big gaps. And ways and to, to go. And today, probably whole ecosystem is based in a way that there's some sort of a collateral. 
So, I mean, collateral for 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 borrowing, uh, collateral for let's say to provide liquidity, to leaving funds there. So, mm-hmm. yeah, I mean, it's definitely now it's it's a different story. I mean, there's a lot of information about it. Very Why, common. Yeah. You know, what's kind of interesting about your point about how like the Ethereum Reddit community would it would be very against collateralized lending is that I think that Bitcoin had the same evolution where in early Bitcoin, people were very against Bitcoin lending in general. And then miners, they were unable to kind of like manage their treasury. And suddenly you started seeing Bitcoin lending and, and the miners always like drive the financial innovation, I find before it kind of reaches like goes up the stack to like the user. And so I bet you around that time, the Ethereum miners would have been like, this is amazing. But the Ethereum Reddit users are the exact, are usually not miners. So it's like, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And, and also like kind of like, it's it's more of a, like a professional user group. So kind of they, they have the need. And, uh, and I think kind of like Reddit also, you know, the user group there was more of a retail. So today, if you talk about let's say DeFi and and you know it's it, it's very much understood what's 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 going on, but because the, the ecosystem has grown uh, substantially, and uh, but then it was like starting to grow, and it was like weird times, you know, 2016, 17, uh, a bit of uh, 18 as well, yeah, 18, and and then 90 was a bit easier, I think when when. Um, Maker system and ma- ma- makers practically the stablecoin die started to pick up and and there's more more kind of like uh, things being built on top of that like when ecosystem started to grow it it was it became more kind of like core because the, then mm. then you could, you will not need always to explain everything from 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 scratch. That I was actually about to ask you if MakerDAO because for me at least MakerDAO and the die minting was like the first time I understood this idea of like collateral in crypto that would actually create something else. Um, for me, at least that was the educating point. Like that was the, that was the, the project that got me on board, I guess. And that yeah. was, I think like that, that process was happening, I believe like throughout 2018. Yeah. So yeah, I think 2017, that wasn't really like a known yeah. concept. And two thousand, I, I actually I quite quite remember because you know uh, back in then our lending model did, didn't have any stable coins. So I mean the only stable coin practically was uh, Tether, which was an Omni chain. And how we solve the stability? So uh, obviously you want also to to borrow a sta- stable currency is that we 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 pegged the e- Ether. So practically you put a loan request and and you lend out. Uh, let's say 100 USD worth of ether, and then then you borrow 100 USD worth of ether and re- return, let's say after six months, 100 USD worth of ether. That works pretty well, but kind of the issue is the kind of like the accounting side of it. It's way easier to just hold die that doesn't fluctuate, and then practically borrow uh, one USD, let's say worth of ether, and then because you you, you practically need to convert it to fiat or uh, purchase whatever you need to purchase. And it, it, like makers solve a lot of interesting issues, and uh, like we try to kind of build upon it. And what I, mm-hmm. I I think for me the the coolest realization of the whole DeFi space is that it started when we st- started to see a lot of projects coming in, building different things, and you started to actually like understand and you know look at their ideas and and started to build on, on top of those ideas and kind of like rehyping those. Uh, kind of like uh, initiatives. I'm trying to understand what ETH Lend was before Dai. Actually, was it just this like ETH collateral to ETH? Yeah, so <laughs> it seems like such a weird. Like, what would you use that for? Yeah, yeah, because you could you could kind of uh, borrow USD peg. But our goal was actually that they use tokens as a collateral and and then borrow uh, ETH. And the the funny part is that ERC twenties weren't that like uh, big thing yet. So 2016. Beginning of 2017, uh, practically the, the market capitalizations were quite small. And one of the mm. things, like what was interesting, that the liquidity started to grow. You know, as we we saw Kyber coming in and 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 also like tech liquidity increase, is that kind of like you don't need to separate any more risks that you can actually pull things together. And uh, in Ethland, we always thought about it that let's let the 
kind of like uh, counterparties handle their own risk. So let's say let let the lender fund collaterals, loans with, with collaterals they're comfortable in. We didn't want to like put pools together. And today it's it's very obvious that actually like uh, I think Taro knows uh, pretty well that you can do a lot of magic when you actually kind of like have compositions and you know pooling and there there is many elements involved. Yeah, I mean, actually, you've talked about kind of the early days, but one kind of question is how how were you able to kind of start with sort of a coin offering in 2017 and survive through the lean times of 2018, especially in 2018 when um, I think at least from the investor standpoint, investors were really interested in like other layer ones or like basically anything on this podcast that has been featured was funded in 2018 instead of like Ethereum based finance. And so, you know, you, you survived through that period and then launched. So, so like maybe walk us through like how you did that and what it was like, kind of like going through the downturn and then somehow kind of having this like miraculous exponential growth after. I mean, 2018, those were really dark days. <laughs> I would dark say. Dark days of 2018. I, 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 I felt personally kind of like being in a, uh, you know, ship where everyone is just like jumping out and you, you started to become more lonely in the space because many projects, they, nothing happened. And somehow like when, when the um, bear market started to happen and it was very steep, many of the ideas didn't have a lot of uh, merits and, we we actually had already a product in back back in in 2017 and before the funding, but kind of like we understood that the product isn't good enough. So so kind of like uh, that we have to con- continue building things and and still still keep up. And during actually that 2018 and even 2017, one particular point I want to highlight is that many of things that was happening on Ethereum, for example, usually projects choose a kind of like a horizontal approach in the sense that they they wanted to create a, a protocol that other protocols will then consume and the other protocol that that was building want to create a protocol that uh, other protocols w- were consuming and you had this kind of like layers of verticality and and then there was questions about a- adoption and you know there's so many steps in user experience and so forth so no one wanted to go to actually the end user like kind of like end to end from the protocol all the way to end user. And for us, it was always from the beginning kind of like a point that we, we want to just try to do something that actually the users will use and and, and kind of like focus on the, the, the end user. And this is kind of relates even today that we focus quite a lot on the user experience. So we, we try to try to always keep that relationship uh, to the end user and, and not only build on a protocol scale. And during 2018, I, I definitely noticed that uh, it was kind of like you you were building things, but uh, you're building in a in a silo a bit. So there wasn't any distractions and so forth, which was good because probably we focus in 2018 and actually even 2019 quite a lot on on just brainstorming ideas and and trying to figure out ways to build things, implementation. So we spent a lot of time on those. And actually, that's very healthy. So, in one way, the market wasn't healthy, but but the way we we developed and we had time to think things, that was super healthy. And I think that's the way that yeah. protocols should be built. So you should like you should not have this this kind of like a pressure of of getting things quickly on the market because some other protocol made this feature and everybody loves that, and you have to come something else that everyone loves you again and <laughs> kind of have this you know. Um, attention competition uh, all the time and even though like we felt bad like because of the market and everything but we felt good that we could actually just build things and like without much of distraction in a way the the price was so much in the toilet that i guess like (laughs) everyone had already given up and just left you alone (laughs) i don't know how your token went exactly but i just know oh it went down there was almost this (laughs) it was it was yeah harsh Although the trough to current level is is kind of one of the craziest things I think that has ever happened in the history of cryptocurrency. The the recovery of Ave is kind of honestly just insane. You need to plot it on a log chart and like just look at how many orders of magnitude it's jumped. I mean it's 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 actually amazing to see like the ICO price is actually a tiny blip relative to the the current yeah. 
And even like post ICO, it went so down. It's just like, and you have a lot of kind of like community members that are also like living on the on the prices and so forth. So that's that's kind of like you you feel the pressure, and it's it's mm-hmm. actually enormous pressure that what protocol builders have. It's it's not just pressure from the community, but like pressure to to succeed and pressure of security, pressure of it's it's it, it's a hard business, but end of the day we're building some stuff that is in some extent very groundbreaking and i've realized that hmm. maybe recently for us it's it's always about innovation but now that there is like defi became an epicenter in in crypto i kind of understood that we actually have what we're building the whole uh, ecosystem here is is going is going to be something very significant i mean if if people will start to use more defi and 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 the networks will of clog. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I want to talk about that later on, actually. But first, I want to, I think one of the topics that we wanted to cover in this episode with you is that of flash loans. Now, flash loans is something that we've actually mentioned. I think, Tar- Tarun, you were in that episode. It was in twenty beginning of 2020 at the Stanford Blockchain Conference, where we, we actually just talked about it off the cuff. We gave a quick definition. But flash loans is, as I understand it, an invention or like one of the features, one of the, I don't know what you call it, but like concepts that Ave pioneered. Yeah, I think I, I, I think Ave didn't kind of like pioneer it because um, in, in terms of like flash loans, we have seen implementations beforehand and kind of like, I but see. What, what, what Ave did very well is that we made it pop culture. So, so practically uh, when we launched, flash loan was actually like one of the latest features we had it. We we talked about it, like how cool would be this and that, what kind of things you could do, and actually we were even thinking that me like it never was actually a feature, but then like at some point we uh, I don't know was it like we had time in development or something we practically added uh, the the flash loan function and in the beginning we didn't see that much of usage in in January and I actually took it. Like I took a kind of a big initiative to actually campaign that hey we have these flash loans and in hackathons and also in in like very vocally being in the community and trying to get people to build things because there's so many use cases that you could do uh, be, besides hacks uh, and <laughs> or our so-called arbitrage and <laughs> in, so, and at some point we started to see like uh, interesting things to be built so first projects and then came the the, the big hacks with flash loans. And and then then of course mm-hmm. like that was uh, more PR and at some point we realized that well we already have like a half a billion flash loans and the whole year was two billion worth of flash loans in in the whole year wow. from Aave so it's a uh, it's a neat functional fu- functionality. Um, I think I think our audience probably knows what a flash loan is, but I do think it might not hurt to just quickly say just for our audience it's a flash loans are a tool that lets developers borrow instantly without collateral. And they can do this as long as they return the liquidity within one block transaction. So it's almost like yes. a me- like an inst- that's why it's called flash. Basically, it's like an instantaneous loan and then repayment. And what yeah. they do with that loan is where and like this is interesting that you actually use the term hacks, these flash loan hacks, because I always understood them as sort of like arbitrage loopholes. Like yeah. they found price differences basically in different protocols and were able to use this this instantaneous flash loan concept to like do a bunch of things, like kind of basically just like shave off those the differences as as profit. Yeah, and that's exactly and practically we, we when it comes to like the, the, the hacks and, and arbitrage, like definitely I think like the arbitrage is is what happens, but let's say a hack as exploit. So one of the interesting things about uh, DeFi is if, if there's a protocol where, you know, there's some sort of like a possibility to exploit, is it designed as, as it should be or is it just arbitrage? Because there are people in the DeFi community that think that every like exploit in a smart contract is an arbitrage opportunity. Mm. And, but I don't feel that way. I, I think kind of like it's, if, if there is a chance that users can lose serious amount of funds, Maybe the protocol isn't designed that way because you will not deploy anything like that. I mean, Aave, for example, we, I know a lot of protocols will not want to deploy stuff that actually makes their users feel upset. And that's the kind yeah. of thing. But the, the, the interesting part about Flashlon is, is how they help people without 
then users probably knowing it. So when you go to uh, this app called DeFi Savior, or for example, InstaDApp, that are practically ways to manage your different positions. You have you might, for example, created a uh, vault in, in MakerDAO, uh, borrowed or created printed DAI, and, and practically you spend that DAI, but you want to close that vault. Your, your Ether, for example, might be there stuck. So you could do that. You can't do that if you don't have the, the funds available. But uh, what you can do is that you just practically go to these services and click a button and confirm transaction. And what happens in the background is that a flash loan is taken from the Aave protocol in, in, in form of DAI. Then practically the, the loan is closed. Ether is taken away from the, uh, the collateral and, and then partly sold to DAI. The flash loan is returned. And, and then the user gets the rest of the collateral. And cool part about flash loans is that there is a reward for using that liquidity. So it increases the kind of on that block, the deposit rates. And, and that's a small but quite meaningful uh, gesture for, for the depositors. That's cool. I actually didn't know that flash loans were now being used in other protocols. That's super, that's news to me. Tarun, you probably knew that, but that's really cool to I hear. think it was used in other protocols before it was used for attacks. Uh, <laughs> it, it's just Let's, that, like, no one, no one, it's just that, like, I think the problem with DeFi is the opposite of the problem of the ZK community. Where in the ZK community, everyone, like, talks about the engineering, but never the users. And in DeFi, everyone only talks about the users and trading and not about the actual engineering. But a lot of the engineering <laughs> yeah. work is actually being done, has been done in January, like the first flash loan DeFi saver stuff was like a long time ago, actually, right? Like I remember yeah, the, okay. the the integration was, so it's just, I think people don't pay attention to the GitHubs as much as they should in DeFi. I think now, yeah. now in the last six months, I've noticed it's increased a lot. Like the comments have yeah. increased a lot, but in the bear market days, like I remember in 2018 mm. and 19, I'd right? like look at your repo, compound, maker, and like there was like basically no contributors like even doing code reviews or like looking at stuff. Yeah, yeah, and I, I think that's that it should there should be more actually activity, but I, I think now protocols are opening more to development and and with with the uh, community developers grant programs. So what I hope to see is that actually there will be more community developers that are participating in different protocols in in that way, kind of like a uh, contributing. So. I, I think the the best days of development community for for Ethereum projects is is just like coming up. That's 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 my uh, take. Mm. Yeah, for sure, that definitely makes sense. What other projects since then have actually started to experiment with flash loans? Is there new concepts around flash loans? Is it is has it actually evolved more recently, or is it still what was released in January twenty twenty? I I think there's like. I would say like uh, applications where you can make you know capital efficiency for for the the end users. So I would say like for example, a way to swap debt is is one of the coolest things. Uh, Instead of it's a good example. So you could swap debt between let's say compound of a back and forth depending on the interest rates. And and practically what's happening in the background is that there's a flash loan that is taken paid off. And there's inter interesting kind of like uh, developments. Every time you're in a position where you need capital to do transactions and, I mean, change positions, you kind of always have to evaluate whether flash loans could be used. But I still think, could there be something else uh, in, in the future? I think probably, yeah. I mean, I, I never doubt the you know innovation that, that uh, we have in the Ethereum community because... I think many of the projects are innovating quite a lot, but someone comes comes out of the blue and you know has very cool stuff, things that I would mm. not expect to 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 happen. And especially when you look at traditional finance, how how things work there, what kind of products and services there are, and how you could build them in 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 the DeFi ecosystem, there's a lot of innovation. And I, I think the various DeFi projects has an interesting formulas and. And even like in other protocol, there there's still a lot of things to do. There there's still a lot of things to do. Optimize, innovate on interest rates, risk, and I don't think we are still even. We're not peaking. DeFi is not peaking yet. I I don't think so. I have a last question about uh, flash loans specifically, though, which is the type of tokens that you can actually have flash loans with. I don't know if I just said that right, but like, you know, like obviously you can take a flash loan of ETH. You can take a flash loan of DAI, 
I guess. But like, there's also some weird crappy coins. Like, is it any ERC-20? Are there any limitations? Yeah, I'm just curious, like how you actually deal with the various types of tokens and the flash loan concept. Yeah, so at least at Aave, you could flash borrow uh, ETH and, and other shit coins. <laughs> I, I, <laughs> I, <laughs> <laughs> Unlimited? Anybody? As much anything? as there is, of course. So so this is the this interesting part. So where's liquidity and where now other protocols are also implementing the flash loan feature. If that particular asset is listed there as liquidity, you can do it. But what's now interesting is that uh, some of the protocols are implementing minting functionality. So I, I don't know if, if mm-hmm. MakerDAO already has, but practically, uh, I think they have the ability to they, mint. Th- this proposal didn't pass governance oh. <laughs> uh, to add flash mints. <laughs> but maybe it's good because I I, I don't know about you, <laughs> Flash Tarun, mints are a little I, bit scary. <laughs> yeah, I, I don't feel confident. <laughs> For the listeners, flash mints are basically, imagine, so a flash loan lets you borrow an arbitrary amount of capital in a pool, take a function that depends on capital, provide it as the input, let the function execute. If the function doesn't halt, that means it's found an arbitrage condition or some type of uh, reasonable state that can pay back the loan, and then the loan is closed. A flash mint is, imagine you have a function where I say, hey, what if I had an infinite amount of die? Like, how would that change my function? So I go to the DAI contract, say, hey, mint an infinite amount of DAI, run my function in a single transaction, and then burn all of that DAI. And so it's it's a little scarier in that now, now you really do meet the Bitcoiners' wor- worst nightmare of, like, no supply <laughs> cap. But when you say it didn't pass, where didn't it pass, Tarun? MakerDAO governance. Ah, okay. So flash minting isn't MakerDAO right now. This is. I the... mean, someone, there's a pull request that already has it implemented. It's just that governance voted not to add it to the core protocol. I see, I see. But like flash minting, is this something that one could also propose for Aave? It's for an ERC-20. Yeah. So it's just for any yeah. asset you can add it. Oh, I see. So like once the proposal... Oh, so that, that was actually the question. Is it the ERC process or was it like the MakerDAO internal governance? No, no, it's the ERC da- process. No, no, sorry, it's MakerDAO. Uh, uh, there, there is an oh, ERC is. for flash minting, but I don't think that's going to... I mean, like, people have made flash mintable tokens. It's just none of the ones that have high money velocity ha- have flash minting added, right? Like, like, at the end of the day, yeah. you need a token that people actually care about to have this feature mm-hmm. for anyone to do anything super malicious with it. But it is weird, because you could imagine a flash loan calling a flash mint, and, like, that to me actually is like one of the mm. kind of weird you you flash borrow some asset <laughs> and then you use that as collateral to borrow something that's flash mintable and then you call flash mint on it so obviously uh, there there's constraints yeah. to this on like what functions can get executed in a flash loan but it's kind of interesting and i think there's a good reason people don't want to add it <laughs> Mm. I'm, I'm now remembering James actually in that episode, the more recent episode, we talked about this and he said that it's only when like flash minting would only work if it's actually implemented into the DeFi protocol contract. Am I right? Like you, like Ave would have to enable it for Ave particularly to be able to flash mint. Yeah. For the, for the Ave token, for example. Yeah. But like the ERC, the ERC already exists. Like there is a standard of uh, on how to do it, and so yeah, just just for our audience to understand a little bit more. Yeah, yeah. what's interesting actually was Don was was that unlimited minting or did they actually have a cap? They had a cap function, yeah. but it was initially set to minus one, so infinite to max int. Oh, <laughs> yeah, because I could imagine <laughs> like let's say if there is certain amount of die, let's say two billion. Well, of course, in that case, you could use something that Aave, which has already died to, to flash borrow, but maybe if it has some cap. But then again, if I, I'm thinking about it, like the idea of it, yeah, I mean, now nah, you will just go to Aave and, and just do flash loan from there if, with the die. I mean, you don't need the minting unless there is not enough liquidity anywhere in die. Then you could have the right. cap. You could imagine a flash yeah. loan that does something where it makes an LP share and it mints a bunch of it flash mints die to like manipulate oh, the Oracle price. Yeah. So it it's it's a little bit weird. You could actually like basically drown out all the other LPs with a flash mint. Yeah. Yeah, that's that's right? scary. That's the part where I think it's scary. Yeah. Like you don't want those in Uniswap cuz like it'll it'll kind of actually mess up a lot of the arbitrage incentives. But actually one thing I I did kind of talk about which is, you know, uh, and this is something I spent a lot of time trying to explain to like kind of technical people in finance 
is that like flash loans are actually like extremely unique to crypto and they don't exist in the normal market, but there are analogs and it, you know, they're kind of unique because with the blockchain, you can verify whether, you know, like the loan actually was used for the thing it was supposed to, the thing made a profit and it can be returned. But in, in like the financial market, there, there's a lot of like stuff that looks quite a bit like this, where like a bank will give you a really, really short term loan for you to do a trade and then you pay it back, like repurchase agreements. And so I actually am curious, do you think, you know, I know you guys are making like an institutional push and a push for like more non DeFi native users, which is great. How do you see institutions using flash loans or like maybe bigger entities? Yeah, I mean, it's, it's quite interesting question like obviously like if they if they're doing something in in, in DeFi and they need the liquidity but uh let's say that they they're trading and they they, they want to use flash loan to flash borrow and it trades but one of the things could be fascinating is that uh if you're on the level in the institutional usage that you are actually tokenizing things and uh upon that tokenizing imagine like that you could tokenize some sort of debt or any kind of like uh, not even debt but could be anything and you, you you practically could just temporarily mint enough in DeFi that it becomes like very attractive then you can ask a question like you have an instrument that is in traditional finance that actually is in, in value let's say 1 million but you could temporarily in, in DeFi get it into 10 million and that might be interesting it's could have interesting like dynamics in terms of like is it in that case, you know, if you want to do stuff, would you rather do it in DeFi than than in paper finance and in traditional finance? But that that could be something I I could see like innovative way of getting flash loans in, into something where you know you you can't stretch. You have an instrument that you can't just stretch in traditional finance. It's just like uh, it, it will not work because of the nature. But when you tokenize that that asset, then you have mm. the value on chain, and then you with, with the main thing you can stretch because you are actually the instrument doesn't it, it, it doesn't decrease in, in value of this one block minting because the next block is back in the same position again unless someone else stretches on that block that could be something although then you'd then come back though with this stretched amount and you'd need some some vehicle to like reimburse that on into the like real world assets i guess yeah i, I could imagine that some cool situation where you have a couple of this this kind of like assets and and then you can you basically you pile up even this asset, this kind of asset types that are very difficult to stretch in in traditional finance, and then you create a marketplace where you can trade with these assets, and then you will have a, a bit more margin on your trades, or you can use them somehow. I, I, I honestly, I I don't know what could be that, that kind of asset, but I, I could imagine that this could be interesting in institutions to kind of realize that maybe that could be a way of utilizing flash loans that we have something that we we have limited amount, but we can actually quite easily trade it. And, and uh, yeah, it could, I don't know, that could be one thing. I mean, I mean, one of the things is the way I usually explain what a flash loan is, is like, imagine to a trader is like, if you're a trader and you go to like an exchange and you say, hey, I want to borrow, you know, X amount of Bitcoin for one hour, the exchange will quote you some price. And if you say, I want to borrow it for 30 minutes, they'll say, I'll quote you half the price roughly. And if you say 15, they'll say roughly half the price. Now, what happens when you say you want to borrow it for zero duration? Mm. And it's actually impossible in normal finance yeah. to actually do a zero duration loan unless you can verify in the way that you can on chain. Um, and so there is kind of a question of like, what assets are compatible with zero duration loans? And, and those are the types of things where like, there's a ton of instruments actually in, in traditional finance that are kind of illiquid, where people are too afraid to borrow against them, unless it's a really, really long time period. But there's kind of the flip side, which is actually if you could do a zero duration loan and take a small percentage of the basis point on this really illiquid asset, you would totally offer that. And so that's sort of where I've always been kind of curious how finance people, if it, this is communicated correctly to them, would like figure out like, oh, like houses barely trade, but somehow I can like exactly. get some margin exactly. on my house on like the brick in my house. And like, you know, I think that's more interesting than like, hey, I tokenized a house, buy one brick from this house. <laughs> yeah, exactly. You, you basically, 
you you give a you give additional functionality, you provide more efficiency. I I, I think yeah, I would really love to see this happen, like in a way like that. You know, the, like you always see like flash on like in use cases that people build like in efficiency, but this will be like actually the tokenization level, and and it could be cool to see like if if something happens. Yeah, I mean, in, in general, I think there should be more tokenization. I mean, I would love to see more different kinds of assets, but there, there's their own challenges there as well. I, I always feel like this is the real reason to bother tokenizing like a, a real world asset. So people are always like, oh, like, what's the point of tokenizing a real world asset? I can make an SPV, a special purpose vehicle or a REIT, like a real estate investment trust put a bunch of things in there and sell you shares in it. And isn't that the same? Why do I need a token? But actually, the zero duration loan is is fundamentally impossible in the world of <laughs> lawyers <True>. and pens. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> sorry, not to, your, not, not to insult your former colleagues, mm. but it's actually impossible mm. in that world. Where, whereas I actually think if you're tokenized, you get this functionality. And I think that that's one of the the until this year, I didn't realize mm. that that's actually the real, yeah. you know, kind of in crazy benefit of tokenized assets is you get stuff like this. Well, Taro, we have a weekend. We can build something. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. Okay, so more recently, you have a new function or instrument called credit delegation. What is what's credit delegation? Yeah, so, so practically how the lending and borrowing works in Aave is that, uh, let's say, a uh, user comes into the, the protocol deposits, let's say, assets, and, and then starts to earn interest, right? Then a credit line is open to you, so you could actually borrow against your assets. But I think it's roughly 70% of the depositors, they actually are not exercising their credit lines because their interest more lies in, in actually earning yields. And what we realized that actually that what you could actually do is delegate that credit line that you have to, to someone else that you might trust. For example, I could delegate to Tarun, I, I, I trust him. I could delegate to a smart contract that has some sort of closed loop function that it can only farm a token and then I can call back the delegated funds. Or one interesting function is just that that trusted person could be an entity. So I could imagine that some beautiful day there might be a some kind of like a uh, institution that is borrowing that. So so we're delegating to the institution and they're, they're borrowing from Aave without a collateral. So so this is the, the, the key thing. So the depositor keeps the collateral and keeps earning on, on, on the deposit, but then there's the, the delegatee takes the, the, the borrowings. And what could be interesting in this entity relationship that you could convert it to, let's say, dollars and put it to work in traditional finance. So kind of that we get DeFi uh, a two-way stream. So there's there's assets coming in, liquidity coming in, but also it's a way of source liquidity and consume and, it. And for the record, you know, uh, this this type of thing does happen in, in, in traditional finance uh, quite often because it, it, it sort of like helps you have the appearance of under collateralized loans that are actually technically collateralized. Yes. So, so but normally, like what we're used to in DeFi is we have cryptographic collaterals, right? But very typical uh, scenario in you know traditional financial world is that you're going into a, a bank and and you're taking a loan and you have a co-signer. So, so someone else is 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 putting the collateral and you're borrowing. But in essence, like what we're looking to achieve is that some some sort of way that we add a bit more like trust networks around uh, the the protocol. What's good about this, like in the in like technical sense, risk sense, is that the protocol doesn't bear additional risk. So the protocol is collateralized, so it, it has a collateral, and and there's a practically under collateralized loan relationship, but it's practically with the peers, and it, you can even pool it. You can create a vault where there could be multiple depositors depositing into a vault that is borrowing to farm in in DeFi or to convert stablecoins, USD, and, and just let it out in traditional finance. So the next point that I want to talk about with you is I want to talk about the things that nobody wants to talk about, gas prices mm. and usability in terms of the base chain being Ethereum. From where you're sitting, 
you were originally named ETHLEND. You're clearly like deeply within the Ethereum community, smart contracts are at the core of everything you're doing. But what happens in moments when either ETH is so expensive that gas just inevitably is expensive or like the network is so congested that prices also go up for gas. So it makes small, basically small loans or small lending or small, you know, minting, collateralizing, all of those things become incredibly expensive, especially for users that don't have excessive amounts of funds. Mm. So what what are your thoughts on on that phenomenon? Like you've definitely watched it. I'm sure it, it affects your, your thinking. Definitely. Um, yeah, I mean, the... the Original idea also kind of in in Itlen, uh, period is that we we we, we kind of saw the the uh, on chain lending and earning a, a way that you know it, it democratizes a bit because it it's not restricted to borders right and uh, what's cool about the other protocol and, and the deposits is when you deposit let's say 100 USDC you get in return so called A tokens so 100 uh, A USDC and that those A tokens practically grow in balance. So it, it, it's direct crediting of what you earn and plus the underlying debt for, for the depositors. So in essence, it's kind of like a global permissionless savings account and USD nominated that has automated treasury management. And like mm. it's globally accessible to kind of like, it, it's not restricted to, to me. And cool is that practically I will get the same yield, Darren will get the same yield, someone in, in Brazil will get the same yield. So that that kind of that, that, there there's this democracy thing going on, and at the same time, gas prices are getting high. And you know, usually like issue here is that you know if you deposit uh, 100 uh, USDC into the protocol, but you're paying 30 USD in gas and even higher. I mean, we saw some crazy stuff mm-hmm. going on and <laughs> recently, and you are not earning anymore. Actually, you are going into a situation where you're paying to deposit. I mean that's a negative interest rate if you think about it. <laughs> yeah. Totally. I mean I can I can say from personal experience having played around a little bit during DeFi summer but being a little bit of a chicken with the amounts that I actually <laughs> wanted to play around with, I definitely earned nothing because of gas prices. Yeah. Like any any earnings that I made were eaten up by pretty excessive gas prices. So I would say I I fall victim to exactly that. So what what would you say is as a project, what what are you thinking about? How are you? Do you, it sounds like this democratization is your goal? So this sort of prevents it. Like, are you looking at L twos? What are you thinking? Yeah, I, I think uh, we always try to state that like Ethereum is like our headquarters. Uh, the, the community is here. It's it's a great community, and I think just talking about the tech, practically what we have here is is enormous security in the sense that. Uh, how much kind of like Ethereum as a network secures transactions. But I agree that you don't need to secure all the transactions at the same level. So imagine a, a system where you go to a bank and you transfer funds and all the people in the world would need to kind of like accept that that transfer is... Say yes. Yeah. <laughs> the, yeah. Then you have secure high security, but not all the transactions need this and, and use cases. And like... This is always kind of like an issue for us because as, as we want to be uh, Ethereum native, we also understand that if everyone is going to layer twos and we're staying here, like we will, we will become like the Bitcoin of, of, of like, uh, you know, lending protocols, <laughs> the, the, the maxes. Well, well, I actually did just while, while we were talking, think about a weird use case of credit delegation, which, uh, which actually matches this L2 question. Which is, imagine a credit delegation from someone who wants to fund someone to be a validator for a layer two. Yeah, for example. So you do need some base yeah, protocol. Yeah. You need this type of stuff on the base protocol yeah. because even the layer two, you're not getting around the fact that someone's locking up capital on the base protocol. Yeah. And so in some sense, you you can't forsake the layer one at all. You have to just make it easy to transfer from the, a layer one position to layer two. Yeah, and that's that's the kind of thing in it. So the cool thing is that if the layer two ecosystem is is big enough, you know, you could just access directly and and you know, buy assets and if there's gateways. But the 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 beginning will be very not like this. I mean, the beginning is like transition phase. And the thing is that uh, usually, like when we start discussions, we have calls with with some of the other DeFi project like projects. We we 
the start of the discussion. So, what's your like uh, L two like strategy? And everyone is asking the same question wow. all the time. Is is <laughs> and and <laughs> it, it, yeah. this reminds me of 2017 when like every Fortune 500 CEO company was asked, "What's your blockchain?" Yeah, strategy? exactly, exactly the same. <laughs> <laughs> What's your L2 strategy is taking it over. And this is Damn. this is challenging because some of the projects are they you are know, doing things on let's say OBM and then you have some cool stuff like you have the uh, uh zero knowledge with uh ZK Sync which is quite interesting because you, you practically can eliminate this this kind of like a work force that you need people to validate and 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 also the the starkware and and also there's there's Matic and pl plasma and and you know there's different kinds of things and you know you could po cross port like make usability everywhere like with with the token as positions but you know deploying infrastructure to each and every blockchain is a big thing so if let's say if you have to change something uh, in the main chain with the same infrastructure you have to change in other places and and also if you think about uh, for example zk making proofs on all of the functions and it's it's not that straightforward so it's it's kind of like a it, it's it's still a big question to us like how we'll do the layer two and and it's not just about layer two it's just about how we make get rid of the the, the gas issue what one thing to point out is flash loans and zero knowledge proofs are not it's not actually even clear that they can be compatible with each other. Exactly. Oh, true. So, so, so we already lose one baby. <laughs> the, the, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> there are projects that are emerging that have the exact same, or like it's very, very simple for Ethereum-based smart contracts to be redeployed on new chains. Is this anything you've even considered? Or do you feel like even asking the question is a bit sacrilege? No, we, we have actually. and and you know the work that goes there and and managing i mean once you deploy you deploy but but then you, you kind of like i think probably like we estimated that the the biggest work actually is to manage the risk so if you have like let's say different chain and the thing is it's it's not just kind of like uh, i would say like in risk wise uh let's say there's three interesting chains that we want to deploy so first we have our own different other markets and then we have the different chain deployments it's it's a whole lot of work. So one of the our, our things is that we want to decentralize our risk management so that there's parties that can contribute to the risk management and guide the, the governance and that, that could help. But it's it's quite a lot of work. And at the same time we want to keep the you know rate of innovation constantly high enough. So any management thing will actually like draw it back. And you know, some of the stuff I still need, want to see that they work, like OVM. I want to see it actually work. <laughs> so, so uh, things are very early. And the good thing about like protocols like Aave is that it's not like, kind of like one of the first that needs to be in in layer two because you know, obviously trading and that requires like more more frequent stuff could be. But still, I mean, if everyone is going somewhere. It's 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 like we have to be the same party, so so I mean, there's no other choice. I mean, <laughs> <laughs> so I I by the way I, I I this reminds me of an allegory that was told to me by someone who's a friend of mine who is like the third or fourth employee at Dropbox, and um so like in 2010, basically you know iPhones kind of just came out like the app store like the non you know, Cedia, George Hotz, a legal app store, but like the Apple app store just started. And Dropbox was like, okay, we only have enough engineering resource to build for one platform, either Apple or Android. And they chose Apple and Samsung after a while. And this reminds me a lot of all the layer ones right now. And Stanny, you can tell me if this matches your experience, but this is kind of what I have observed is, Samsung came to them and was like, hey, look, we will pay you to build your app and we will build your entire app for you if you put it on, if you make an Android app and support it and whatever. And, you know, I think he, he was saying like startups at that time of their stage were like maybe 50% of apps took those deals and the other 50% didn't and stayed on Apple. But he said within two years, 100% went back to Apple. <laughs> so like, yeah, I thought that was like a very interesting thing. It reminds me a little bit about this, about the and current. Do you uh, remember there was already thrown a bit like uh, 
I mean, this this gas thing isn't like a, a a new thing. There was like way long time ago. I mean, uh, can't remember the the time frame where like the layer twos and everything. There was a lot of discussion and people were planning. And was it actually even before the bear market or something that then people forgot what about it or something? But you know, oh, the the crypto kitties. Yeah, thing oh yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah, oh, yeah. 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 <laughs> Wrecked yeah. the network. You know, the I think the thing that's interesting is like other layer ones always capitalize on on this moment to raise more money. But the interesting <laughs> thing right now is like I think like 2018, all the new layer ones and professor coins and stuff were like, oh yeah, we're gonna like beat Ethereum on our own. Like we'll build our own stable coin, we'll do this, we'll do that. 2019, they're like it maybe a little more hesitant about that thesis. And then this year, 2020. Like since summer, all I've seen is every layer one being like, we're building a bridge. And so that basically mm. turns them into layer two. Yeah, exactly. And I think everyone's going to kind of end up being a layer two. And now the layer, the competition amongst layer twos might be more intense than the competition oh, among apps I for agree. liquidity. That's my, that's my 2021 prediction. Yeah, that's crazy. The fight for block space is going to be aggregators fighting. Layer twos are a form of aggregators. Things like urine okay. are a form of aggregators. So individual users won't actually be making single transactions they'll be batched somehow yeah yeah sorry that's my that's my hot take that's 20, interesting. 20, 20 interesting. prediction all right stani this has been a really cool conversation and dig into ave i i have one last question that i want to ask you which is about kind of going back to the story you told about your background being having studied law since you know law and you know this space super well, like what is your feeling on kind of regulation, how the laws of the ecosystem work versus the laws of the real world? I don't know if we should say that anymore. The the other world, we're all so used to just staring at screens that I don't actually know what the real world actually is anymore. But anyway, mm. yeah. What's your thoughts on regulation? You know, at some point you, you kind of like think about like how, you know, what, what should be the relationship with, with regulation we have? And what what we're doing, what's happening in in the uh, space, and when you're dealing with smart contracts, it's kind of like a, one of those things where it's practically regulation. So it's, it's just different type of regulation because the nature is different. So traditionally, law has been created to protect, right? So so you create law, then you create also agreements on top where, on on matters that that practically you can agree upon, and eventually you go to court if something went the other way. And what we have now is is that um, practically all kinds of rules could be built into smart contracts, and we need to go to court because uh, they're they're self executing. The issue, of course, is that most of the value in transactioning is happening in the legacy systems, but it doesn't actually like restrict most of the stuff going into the decentralized way. You know, even like in the physical world, there there, there could be decentralized networks there. And then you have the the actual like cryptographic value networks, which is the Ethereum. And one thing we we should do this year is build more kind of uh, you know different kinds of protection mechanisms, in the sense that you know traditionally let's say law has been about uh, could be about the investor protection, consumer protection, and so forth. Those kind of functions could be built into smart contracts and even make better yeah. transparently. And I, I think probably blockchain is the best rec tech tool, the best one. Like you have all this transparency and, you know, practically you can build more security me mechanisms and, and kind of like, it's just like, uh, I, I don't think we have realized yet the, the, the potential here, yeah. like how it could actually, a smart contract could, could replace law completely. That is something mm -hmm. we actually have even thought about one thing I need to uh, chill about Aave is that the, the governance, because we divided the, the vote delegation where you can delegate votes to, let's say, uh, protocol politicians uh, from actually delegating proposition power. And this is interesting in the sense because in, let's say, governments and, and different bodies, usually you have lawmakers that are creating the law, and, and then you have the, the, the politicians who are voting on, on the proposals. And here in decentralized systems, the, the, the law is practically the, the code that we create, right? So, so practically that's the idea. So you have different people for, for creating code, which is the, the regulation, and different people voting whether it's good or bad code regulation practically. There's the old school debate about whether code is law, but uh, 
Uh, it's it's uh, we can have another to- another <laughs> another podcast on that. So. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds like a totally new topic. It's an interesting um, scenario, though, because I always think of crypto as being such a cowboy kind of like Wild West scenario in a lot of ways. And yet what you're describing is like a very rule abiding <laughs> society as well. Yeah. And so that's kind of an interesting juxtaposition. Yeah. I mean, one one thing to note, though, is that lending protocols in general, both Compound and Ave have been kind of the only protocols to prove that they need a governance token so far, <laughs> in some ways, right? Like, I agree. They actually really use them quite a bit. And you actually use them to safeguard assets to be like, we're not going to add this asset, we're going to change these parameters. Whereas like a lot of other governance tokens have very dubious direct utility to the, yeah. to the protocol. I mean, sometimes they might. I'm not, I'm just saying it's, it, it takes a little while. But in, in the case of lending, it's always been something where you need some form of like oversight because you know there's there's an implied social contract. That's true. I I never actually thought about this way, but yeah, I I do agree. I mean, there's so much risk exposure, and I don't think we even realize how 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 much different kinds of risk there are in in, in DeFi. That's also another topic, but but kind of like that's also a cool part part about DeFi because everything is transparent. You can calculate everything, the exposure, and make interesting tools you might not be able to do in the similar extents extensively in traditional finance because you are trusting always someone or, or it'll take you a long time yeah. <laughs> yeah. to get everyone yeah. to give you the data yeah. <laughs> like yeah <laughs> cool so i want to say thank you stani for coming on the show and sharing all of this with us thanks anna thanks tarun it was it was fun <laughs> thanks yeah and uh, to our listeners thanks for listening